read Haley's paper. Haley's paper is about um, projects in Mexico. Uh, so Hillary, not Haley. Um, and that's the before picture. There, there is an after picture as well. Right. So, um, off we go. So this is Ghost Buildings. And I say, Hillary's email details are there. She was quite keen. Uh, in an absence, if anyone's got any questions about this, then please do contact her. Um, and I'll tweet the broad information about that out after us under sort of, uh, that hashtag for uh, 42, and then you can uh, track her down that way. Um, so, heritage units discontents, the power dynamics of heritage projects in southern Mexico. And it's entitled Ghost Buildings. This is a sort of a narrative, so there's, there's a first person thing here. So you're going to have to... Uh, suspend your disbelief. So, on a hot summer day in Osaka City, I was sitting with my friend Nick, a former heritage worker, and we were talking about what makes a heritage project succeed. One of the questions we asked, Nick explained, is how exposed has a community been to heritage discourses? Like, what are we dealing with? It is easy to restore a church. The symbolic power and its obvious religion, religious function means a heritage project restoring chapels is consistently um, legible between institutions and communities. It's when you get to the other stuff that it gets muddy. It gets difficult to convince communities to embark on these kind of collaborations when the heritage project revolves around something with no direct connection to contemporary life. The CASA, a recent restoration project in the mixed tech town of oh, Tepelosacula, I think, was emblematic of that muddiness for Nick. And he used what I found to be particularly compelling language to describe it. It was a ghost building, and it continues to be a ghost building. I asked him what it meant, if he meant it was haunted. Now, the people believe that this was so. What the institution saw, and I as well, was an empty, derelict, pre-Hispanic, early colonial ruin that required both preservation and restoration. But to do that, we had to figure out how to connect it back to the community. And this is exactly why education is so important. If the younger generation can be taught to care about their heritage, then these projects would be much easier. Um, for Nick... The CASA project failed because it was unable to deliver that pedagogy, unable to teach the younger generation to care for its heritage in the ways imagined by the institutions and the archaeologists. But another way, what Nick and his colleagues thought would make the site into a sustainable form of heritage was inextricably bound to their notions of proper relationality. It thus became a ghost building for him as well, disconnected from the proper affects and concerns that a population should have for its heritage. Already here, then, we see how sustainability is not only a neoliberal and economic project, but one that is deeply, morally, imbricated and often asymmetrical. In this paper, I sketch out a few of the ways in which ghost buildings both shape particular understandings of Osaka's heritage worlds and manipulate orientations towards them. The profound moral aspects of ghost buildings are made obvious in the conflict surrounding what counts as a proper relation and the ways in which heritage actors like Nick attempt to figure how a community relates to the past. From this perspective, we can see heritage projects as deeply ritualised, aimed at engendering, at engendering a sense of obligation and acceptance, depending on how the relation plays out on the ground. It is in these ways that they transform society. Morally laden and symbolically potent, ghost buildings materialise when those rituals fail, leave an empty heritage site. They're disconnected from the community which should care for it. This paper thus offers a caution to well-intentioned community archaeologists, noting that even the most seemingly obvious priorities for heritage projects can still prevent necessary conversation and collaboration with the communities whose past we seek to engage with. Otherwise, we risk dispossessing these communities to the right of their own history, leaving heritage sites as static, tourist-focused museums at best, or as in the case of the CASA, completely empty. Except, as I discovered, the CASA was not empty. It had been converted into a bustling children's library, so what then was its failure? What made it, for Nick and his colleagues, a ghost building? So this, there's then a subsection, the CASA, in two perspectives. The CASA is cloaked in ambivalence. It is simultaneously a success and a failure, beautiful and ugly, a job done well and a job badly done, to quote one archaeologist who worked on the project from the mid-2000s. So too, by its very nature, the CASA is a healthy site straddling the cusp of time. Erected during a particularly tumultuous historical period, it is, its very becoming is tied to the transition between pre-Hispanic periods to the early colonial. In this sense, it simultaneously represents the twilight of the mixed tech civilization and the violent upheaval of Spanish domination. Alongside its chron chronological significance, it is locally conceived 
of as a symbol, a confluence of indigenous and Spanish power and authority. And this not only meant in practice, aesthetically it is one of the only surviving examples of a hybrid architecture. So despite the casa being emblematic of a way of life and history, it continues to be a space of liminality, eliciting strong sentiments. In January 2019, the edifice was vandalised with aerosol, resulting in considerable damages that worried conservators due to the porous nature of the stones. So, and that's in 1991, I think, so there's, there's already vandalism on there. Um, the aerosol, when coupled with the history and the porosity, translated into the potential future of the building that was more than just stained by the past, but wounded by the present. But can one wound or scar a ghost? What crystallises through ethnography and news reports is that the casa appears to some as a ghost building because there is no consensus of its meaning, nor how it should function in the community. Despite great efforts on the part of the HH Foundation, which is related to this, uh, to incorporate it back into the social fabric, of the community, it continues to occupy a space in between, a perpetual phantom on the material and temporal horizon. According to Augustine, one of Osaka's senior heritage workers, the Casa made him feel nothing. This was problematic since at least for heritage workers in Osaka, heritage should be full of emotions. It's not Osaka, is it? It's Casa, I think. So apologies for that. Um, Heritage should be full of emotions. Augustine was not alone in his feeling of disdain for how the casa had turned out. Another heritage expert, a veteran community archaeologist, castigated the site for being a restoration gone awry, bordering dangerously on reconstruction. When pushed to elaborate, to elaborate, he reacted like Augustine and confessed that he said too much. Even without veering into the space of too much, both archaeologists agreed in the sense that the typical preservation efforts of a sponsored heritage project should allow the spectator, visitor, community, or whoever, the ability to sense that the building was old. And the problem with the casa was that it pushed even beyond its registration. It looked new or better, renewed somehow, and when the only thing it was supposed to be renewed was the web of relations on the site. It's too shiny, said Guillermo, as he circled the building on another stifling hot day in July. It's like a jewel, but it shouldn't be. You can't tell it's historical. So I guess that's now referring to, to this image. Um, I wish to pause briefly here as there is much to unpack on hand. What is true is that my interlocutors are preoccupied with the way that preservation, restoration and reconstruction are part of a spectrum, bleeding into one another, as well as how ultimately the transformation of the CASA led to something undesirable, a strange, uncanny type of newness rather than the patina that many prefer to see in buildings and objects that enshrine history. This newness did not elicit the corrective effective attachments, no, the correct effective attachments or social relations with the site, or at least the local archaeologists who felt nothing about the site, and they in turn imputed this site a feeling um, to the locals who they felt had similarly found something uncanny and undesirable in the castle. It is these two latter points that I wish to take up here. Preservation and restoration are two sides of the same coin, that is they are rituals of heritage cosmologies concerned with the transformation and transforming our living world. What does it mean that the Casa remains a ghost building and why? As I gestured to above, as I gestured above, it is its categorical failure as a heritage project that leads to its status as a ghost building and thus as an artifact of failed ritual. I call it an artifact of failed ritual because the Casa is a fascinating incident of where there is a material trace, an index pointing to a failed transformation of an anticipated future. A desired event was projected forward with much alacrity and emotion, but it never came to fruition. The failed ritual left in this structure behind for all to view, a mark and a stain on the landscape. Failed rituals generate ghostly effects and effects. So not only must communities and institutions agree with the fate of a building, they must also agree what type of relationships are to be forged. In other words, heritage projects draw on a wellspring of practice and instigate a set of encounters that precipitates confrontations over what history is worth remembering and what a proper relation is. Inextricably enmeshed in an aesthetic discourse brimming with moral judgments, the contingency of heritage rituals suddenly comes into view. Sheer disagreement or a performance taken too far, such as the Casa's restoration gone awry and the audacious liberty of the restoration project leads to alienation within and between all those involved distancing and creating boundaries instead of fermenting and solidifying relations. Um, 
So as a practical but symbolic link to the past that freezes them in mythic time without full approval as well as the expense of potential failure. There are echoes here of a civilizing mission where outsides, outsiders admonish locals to teach them how to care properly for their past, thereby inculcating a set of Western ethics and aesthetics for the purposes of control and extraction. So too, the community and institutions could not agree on how to utilize the space with institutional employees vying for the CASA to be used at its best, sorry, at best, as a sterile repository, a symbol of the past and that alone, while the locals like Mireille and Fabi argued for more dynamic creative space. A ritualized project from the start and steeped in the broad institutional heritage um, failed and brought on a transformation that led to a ghostly formation. From this perspective, the CASA seems like a distinctly sustainable heritage project, but it has only become so, ironically, by ceasing to be a heritage project, by the rejection of actors like Mariella and Fabi under the terms of which their heritage should be constructed and commemorated. <clears throat> the ritual failed, but in doing so, it brought about the possibility of something else, something that might, in fact, be orientated towards a sustainable future rather than frozen in its past. It is extraordinary in telling this, that the abundance of life and vitality was effectively invisible, frozen into a conceptual framework that allowed heritage projects and community archaeology more broadly to exist in specific forms. The reality of the CASA could only appear to them as a haunting. The ghosts of what heritage should be prevented from seeing what it could be become. There we go.